Greetings and welcome to a series of lectures, Intermediate Algebra. We're going to discuss equations and inequalities in one variable, specifically recognizing patterns. All right, for chapter one, uh, section one, let's talk about numbers, variables, and expressions. The great thing about being human is we can recognize patterns really well, and we do that by inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is reasoning in which premises are viewed as supplying strong evidence for the truth of the conclusion. Okay. Prim the premises are the information we're given. We're going to assume that they're true, and then from that information we're going to draw a conclusion. So it's a statement that what an argument claims will induce or justify our conclusion. So let's see an example. Jennifer leaves for school at 7 a.m. Jennifer is always on time. Okay. That's the information we're given, and then we're going to draw the conclusion. Jennifer assumes then that she will be on time if she leaves at 7 a.m. That's pretty strong argument. She leaves the school at 7 a.m. She's always on time. Therefore, she assumes that she will be on time if she leaves at 7 a.m. Now, there's two ways of looking at this argument. One is just on the surface. We're not digging deep. And yeah, the information that we're given does lend itself to the conclusion being true. But if we look at this problem a little bit deeper, then... Does Jennifer get to school on foot? Does she get to school on a bike? Does she get to school on public transportation? Does she get to school driving the car? Now, if she's on foot, generally there's not much that can get in our way when we're walking. Okay? So, yeah, I would say that's a pretty strong statement that, yeah, she leaves for, uh, she'll be on time if she leaves for work, uh, if she leaves for school at 7 a.m. But if she rides a bike, maybe she gets a flat tire. Maybe something happens on the way, she falls down or something. It's a possibility that she'd be late. If she takes public transportation, again, there are outside of her control situations that could prohibit her from getting to school on time by leaving at 7. And the likelihood of her constantly um, Consistently leaving at 7 and getting to school on time if she drives a car. Oh, all types of things can go wrong with a car. It's a mechanical device and things can break, tires can pop, run out of gas, traffic accidents. So yeah, we can look deeper into this situation, but just on the surface, we can kind of say that yeah, it's a strong argument that it is true. Let's look at another one. Okay. The chair in the living room is red. The chairs in the dining room are red. The chair in the bedroom is red. Therefore, we're going to make the conclusion that all chairs in the house are red. Now again, on the surface, you might jump to the conclusion that that is true. All of the chairs in the house are red. But what if? What if the house has a nursery and there's a rocking chair in there that's blue? We weren't given that information. Unless we specifically know that the only rooms that hold chairs are the living room, the dining room, and the bedroom, can we jump to the conclusion that all the chairs in the house are red? Something to think about. Now in math, we can use our inductive reasoning to find numbers or terms in a sequence. For example, 5, 8, 11, 14. If the pattern continues, which that's what the dot, 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 which is an ellipsis, if that pattern continues, then we should be able to inductively reason with ourselves that the next number is going to be 17 in that series. Why? Because 5 plus 3 is 8, 8 
plus 3 is 11. 11 plus 3 is 14, so there's a pattern there. And if the pattern continues, then the next number in the sixth sequence is going to be 14 plus 3, which is 17. 17 plus 3, which is 20. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be number. Sometimes we have shapes. We have a triangle pointing up, a triangle pointing right, a triangle pointing down, a triangle pointing left. If this is a pattern and this pattern continues, we can assume, we can make the, the logical step that the next one will be up, then right, then down, then left, because it's a quarter turn each time. And our third example is 1, 4, 9, 6. Sometimes it's a little bit harder to figure out what the pattern is. Now, from 1 to 4, I added 3. From 4 to 9, I added 9. From 9 to 6, I added 7. Am I just adding all the odd numbers? Well, maybe. Maybe. Maybe that is the pattern. But there's another pattern there. 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16. The likelihood of our next number is, is 25, 5 squared, and then 6 squared, and then 7 squared, and so on. With math, it's really difficult when we talk, don't talk the same language. Um, so let's get some definitions down. Reasoning. I've used the word a couple times, but reasoning is the action of thinking about something in a logical, sensible way. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that it's the touchy-feely type of thinking. It's looking at the evidence and making sense of the evidence that we're given. It's the reasoning. It doesn't mean that we can't think about emotions and feelings, but we are looking more at the thinking, the logical, the factual side versus the emotional side. Inductive reasoning is the reasoning which a conclusion is drawn based on evidence. And math usually involves noticing a few items in a group, have a trait or a characteristic that's in common, and then making the conclusion that all terms in the group have that same trait. Now, the first sequence that we looked at, 5, 8, 11, 14, 17, we added the same value every single time. We added 3. 5 plus 3 was 8. 8 plus 3 was 11. 11 plus 3 is 14, and so on. That is what's called an arithmetic sequence. Arithmetic sequence is just a set of ordered numbers that which, after given the first number, you get from adding the same value or subtracting, if it's a negative number, the same amount to the number before it. So if I give you 5 and 8, you should figure out that the next number is 11, then 14. Usually we give you three numbers to make sure that the pattern continues. 5 plus 3 is 8, 8 plus 3 is 11. Okay, so let's see. We have 4, 7, 10, 13. So, what are we adding each time? Well, if we're not too sure, here's what we can always do. We can take the second number minus the first number, and we get 3. Okay. We take the third number, subtract the second number, we get 3. Now, by that time, you can see it's changing by 3 each time. Just in case, take the fourth number, subtract the third number, and we get 3. This 3 is what's called the common difference. It's changing by 3 each time. Since we're changing by 3 each time, we can find the next number in the series, next number in the series, by adding 3 each time. So the 10, 13, 13 plus 3 is 16, 16 plus 3 is 19, 19 plus 3 is 22, and so on. So when you have an arithmetic se sequence, we have really two steps to figure out what's going on. One, we're going to find the common difference then by doing this subtraction. Second number minus first, what's the difference? Third number minus second, what's the difference? Third, fourth number minus third, what's the difference? 
This is called the common difference. So we're going to find the common difference. Once we find the common difference, that's what we're going to add to continue the sequence. Right, given the sequence of 10, 16, 22, I'm going to take 16 and subtract 10. That gives me 6. 22 minus 16 is also 6. So I know the common difference is 6. So to get to any other uh, value in this sequence, I'm just going to continually add 6. 22 plus 6 is 28. 28 plus 6 is 34. Now sometimes it's not as obvious, but taking the common difference, finding the common difference will always work. So we have 1 half, 1, 3 halves. Well, the first, second number, 1, oops, sorry about that, 1 minus 1 half gives us 1 half. 3 halves minus 1, well, I do have to find common denominator, so 3 halves minus 2 halves is 1 half. So the common difference is 1 half. So 1 half, 1, 3 halves, 3 halves plus 1 half is 4 halves, in other words, 2. 2 plus 1 half is 5 halves, and so on and so forth. When you see a series and it is descending, it is going smaller and smaller and smaller, or it goes from positive to negative, then we must be subtracting something. That's the only way we can get from a big number to a small number with arithmetic sequence is to subtract. So we have a sequence of 5, 0, negative 5. We can still use the way to find the common difference to figure out what's going on. So I take the second number, 0, minus the first number, 5, and I get negative 5. Take this third number, negative 5, subtract 0, the second number, I get negative 5. The common difference is negative 5, so I'm subtracting 5 every time. 5, 0, negative 5, negative 5 plus negative 5 is negative 10, negative 10 plus negative 5 is negative 15, and so on and so on. Now an arithmetic sequence is not the only sequence. An arithmetic sequence is adding the same thing over and over and over again. A geometric sequence is a set of ordered numbers in which each number, well after the first number, comes from multiplying the number before it by the same amount each time. So again, arithmetic sequence is adding the same thing. Geometric sequence is multiplying the same thing. So let's see an example. 4, 12, 36, 108. What would be the next value? First of all, I've got to figure out what did I multiply by. Similar to finding the common difference where we took the second number and subtracted the first number. Well, this time, since I multiplied something to the first number, to figure out what I multiplied, I'm going to do the opposite of multiplication, which is division. I take the second number, divide it for the first, by the first, and we get 3. Take the third number, divide it by the second, we get 3. The change each time is 3. But instead of calling it a common difference, we call it a common ratio. The common ratio each time is 3. 4 times 3 is 12. 12 times 3 is 36. 36 times 3 is 108. And 108 times 3 is 324. And we can continue the sequence from there. Very similar to arithmetic se sequence. To figure out a, a geometric sequence, you're going to find the common ratio. And then, using adjacent pairs, that's the first one divided by, or the second one divided by the first, third one divided by second, and so on. And then you're going to use that common ratio to multiply to the next value. Divide to find the common ratio, multiply to get to the next value of the sequence. Let's look at the sequence 2, 10, 50. Now, if it's not obvious to you, then what we can do is we can take that second number, 10, divide it by 2, and we get 5. Take the fifth value, divide it by the second value, we get 5. We know the common ratio is 5. So to get to the next number, 50 times 5 is 250. 250 times 5 is 1250, so on and so forth. Now, we've looked at all positive numbers, but it doesn't hurt 
uh, to look at something that deals with a negative number. 3, negative 15, 75. Now the clue here is that the sign flip-flops. It went from positive to negative, positive, next one's going to be negative, and it goes positive, negative, positive. If it changes sign, signs like that, the common ratio must be a negative number. Because it's going to be a positive times negative gives you a negative. Negative times negative gives you positive. That's the only way to flip-flop signs. So, but let's stick with trying to figure out the common ratio. Take the second number, negative 15, divided by 3, we get negative 5. Take the third number, 75, divided by negative 15, we get negative 5. So the common ratio is negative 5. Take 75, multiply by negative 5, you're going to get negative 375. And negative 375 times negative 5 gets you positive 1875, and so on. Now, when in doubt, go for finding the common ratio. Sometimes it's not as easy to see what's happening with the sequence. 1 8, 1 4, 1 half. And I want to know what comes next. You can always fall back on... Take the second value, divide it by the first value. Take the third value, divide it by the second value. You'll find the common ratio. One-fourth divided by one-eighth. Well, we don't do division of fractions. We need to do the multiplication of the reciprocal. So one-fourth times eight over one. That's eight times one, which is eight, and four times one, which is four, and it reduces down to two. So far, it's looking like our common ratio is two, but we do want to check the third and second numbers. Third number is one half divided by the second number of one fourth. No division in fractions, so we got to change it to a multiplication of, of the reciprocal. So one half times four over one. One times four is four. Two times one is two, and four over two reduces down to two. So we know we're multiplying by two each time. One eighth times two was one fourth. One fourth times two is one half. One half times two is one. And 1 times 2 is 2, and so on. Sometimes it's a little difficult to see what the um, what the, the common ratio is, but if you do your math off to the side here, it, it won't go wrong. Now, a really interesting sequence for, I guess, math geeks like me is the Fibonacci sequence. Now, the Fibonacci sequence is not quite an arithmetic sequence. And it's definitely not a geometric sequence since we're not multiplying anything. We are adding. It turns out the Fibonacci sequence is a series of numbers in which each number is the sum of the two preceding numbers. Now some mathematicians start the Fibonacci sequence off with zero. Some start it off with one. But here's what the Fibonacci sequence does. You take zero, one, add them together. Zero plus one is one. One plus one is two. 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8, 5 plus 8 is 13, therefore the next number is 8 plus 13 is 21, 13 plus 21 is 34, and so on and so on. That's what the Fibonacci sequence is. Now, the interesting thing about the Fibonacci sequence is it maps very closely to the generation of bees. And this can get a little weird and a little confusing, and I'll show it to you in a, in a minute. But if you are really interested in the Fibonacci sequence, just to see how it works and, and where it is in the world, there's lots of videos out there on YouTube. If you just look up uh, Fibonacci sequence. I love a video by Vihart, V-I-H-A-R-T. She does one for the Fibonacci sequence, and it's amazing that she takes sunflowers and artichokes and pineapples, and the Fibonacci sequence are, is all over them. There's another video that I really like from a scientist, and he explains actually why it occurs in plants. And um, it's pretty amazing, actually. I'm not going to get an all in depth in it, but um, I would suggest checking it out. It's pretty cool. Anyway, let's talk about the bees. The bees, the bees, the bees. And I'm not a, a, I guess that would be an entomologist, a bug person, but I'm going to give you some info. 
Male bees come from an un unfertilized egg, which means mom only. Female bees come from a fertilized egg, fertilized egg which means mom and a dad. Okay. Up arrow is a boy, down the little cross thing are girls. Now, if I start you off with one male bee, unfertilized egg, okay. that's our first generation. If I start you off with a girl, you can have a boy. Right? Mom only, boy. Okay. After that, you now have a mom and a dad, and therefore you can make a girl. From the girl, that came from a dad and a mom, right? From there, this girl came from dad and mom, and the boy came from mom only. Okay, see how this is working here? This girl has a mom and a dad. This boy only has a mom. This girl has a mom and a dad. Now, the interesting thing for me is, switch up a little bit, get myself out of the way. This first generation, I had one B. In the second generation, it also generated one B. By the third generation, I had two Bs. Fourth generation, three Bs. Fifth generation, I have five Bs. And lo and behold, in the sixth generation, I have eight Bs. One, one, two, three, five, eight. The Fibonacci sequence. You can imagine the next generation, on the seventh generation, I will have 13 new bees. On the eighth generation, I'll have 21 new bees. And the next generation, I'll have 34. And the next generation, I'll have 55. So if I want to know in the tenth generation how many bees I'll have, I'll just continue the Fibonacci sequence. Believe it or not, it's, it's true. Fibonacci is everywhere. Now let's get out of biology and get back to math and talk about the order of operations. Let's say I take this piece of paper and on it I write the directions to my house. And then I cut it up into strips and I shuffle it up. Okay, and I give it to you. Would you be able to get to my house? Probably not, because I've scrambled up all the directions to my house. Maybe there's a hundred turns and exits and, uh, you know, whatever that it takes to get to my house. You would not be able to get to my house if I scrambled up all the directions. That's the same in math. We all want to end up in the same location. Therefore, if we all play by the rules, we all follow the directions from the top to the bottom, you would reach my house. Likewise, if you go from, you follow the directions as we state in math, the order of operations, we will all get the same outcome. What are the rules? One, we start with parentheses. Or brackets, they're the square ones. But we start with the parentheses either most inward and work out if they are nested parentheses, one inside the next, or if they're side by side parentheses, we go from left to right. So we have two choices. If they're inside one another, we go from the most inward, outward, or we go left to right. Okay. Then we take exponents. Again, working left to right. That's how we read. We just decided left to right to make sure that everybody's doing it the same way. Then we do all the multiplication and division left to right. And lastly, we perform all the addition and subtraction left to right. Let's take a peek at what it looks like. Okay. Parentheses or brackets Either we go left to right if they're side by side, or inner to outer if they're nested. Exponents, left to right. Multiplication and division are the same level. The reason being is that we can rewrite division as multiplication, and therefore it's the same thing. Okay, left to right. Addition and subtraction from left to right. The reason why addition and subtraction are on the same level is because, once again, we can rewrite subtraction 
of addition, and therefore it is the same thing. Alright, because I'm using my notes and my document camera is not working and I can't write it out live, I'm going to try and go line by line so as not to um, get too forward, too far ahead, and you can follow step by step. So let's take the example 5 plus 3 times the quantity 2 plus 4. Now, just to be very, very clear, that is 3 times the quantity 2 plus 4, so I'm going to force a multiplication symbol in there. I have addition, multiplication, parentheses, and inside my parentheses I have addition. So let's follow our rules. First thing, parentheses. Do everything in the parentheses. Well, it looks like inside my parentheses I have some addition. So, 2 plus 4 is 6. Cool. Okay. All of this can become 6. I now have 5 plus 3 times 6. Addition and multiplication. Multiplication comes next. We don't have any exponents, but we do have multiplication. 3 times 6 is 18. So we change it now to 5 plus 18. Addition is left. 5 plus 18 is 23. Therefore, 5 plus 3 times the quantity 2 plus 4 equals 23. Now the problem is, if we didn't follow those directions, and I just made up my own rules, I would not have gotten the same answer. Here's what I mean. Okay. 5 plus 3 is 8. 8 times 2 is 16. 16 plus 4 is 20. Mm, no, I wouldn't have gotten the same thing as you. So, we need to follow the rules to make sure that we all land up in the same place. Let's do another example. 5 times 2 cubed minus 4 times 3 squared. I have multiplication, exponents, subtraction, multiplication, and exponents. M-E-S-N-E. -E. According to our rules of, of order, our order of operations, from an M-E-S-M-E, -E, the E's come first from left to right. So I can say 2 cubed is 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. And 3 squared is 3 times 3, which is 9. So I can rewrite my problem as 5 times 8 plus, or pardon me, minus 4 times 9. I'm down to multiplication, subtract, and multiplication. From these three operations, multiplication comes first from left to right. So I'm going to do the 5 times 8, and then I'm going to do the 4 times 9. Okay, 5 times 8 is 40, 4 times 9 is 36, so my problem becomes 40 minus 36. I am only left with subtraction, and 40 minus 36 is 4. So my final answer for my original problem of 5 times 2 cubed minus 4 times 3 squared is 4. Now, let's try another example. 20 minus the quantity 2 times 5 squared minus 30. Now again, I'm going to just um, stress that there's multiplication in between this subtraction and this parenthesis. So I'm going to force it to be minus 1 times all of that in the parentheses. So subtraction, multiplication, parentheses. Inside the parentheses, I have multiplication, exponents, exponents, and subtraction. What's first? Everything in the parentheses is first, but I have to follow order of operation inside the parentheses. So between multiplication, exponents, and subtraction, it's going to be exponents first. 5 squared is 5 times 5 equals 25. Our problem becomes 2 times 25 minus 30. I am left with multiplication and subtraction inside those parentheses. So multiplication first. 2 times 25 is 50. Now we're left with 50 minus 30. Subtraction. Okay. 50 minus 30 is 20. So all of that in parentheses is a 20. 
I'm left with subtraction and multiplication. So 20 minus 1 times 20. Between subtraction and multiplication, multiplication comes next. 1 times 20 is 20. So I'm left with 20 minus 20, subtraction left, and 20 minus 20 is 0. So 20 minus the quantity 2 times 5 squared minus 30 is 0. All right, here's another problem. 40 minus 20 divided by 5 plus 8. So we have subtraction, division, and addition. What I would do is pause the video, try and do it yourself and see if you come up with the same answer as I do. Subtraction, division, addition. The one that we do first would be division. So 20 divided by 5 is 4, so our problem becomes 40 minus 4 plus 8. We are left with subtraction and addition. Subtraction and addition are at the same level of hierarchy, so we just do them from left to right. So we're going to do the subtraction first, then we'll end with the addition. 40 minus 4 is 26. 26 plus 8 is 46. So, 40 minus 20 divided by 5 plus 8 is 46. Let's change gears just a little bit and get away from doing math to understanding math. The real number line. Real number line we usually have a straight line with two arrows at each end. We have zero in the middle. And on the right-hand side are our positive numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. The left of the origin, we have our negative numbers starting with negative one, negative two, negative three, and negative four, and working outway, outward. Zero is sometimes also called the origin which to me is a little funny because it's actually the last number that we invented, yet it's our origin. Okay. But we got to start somewhere, and it's good enough point to start on the number line, so we start at zero and we call it the origin. Everything to the right is positive. Everything to the left is negative. Now, if I move rightward, if I go in the right direction that way, I don't know if I can make a little arrow, but uh, if I move, oops, sorry, if I move to the right, going that direction, that is in the positive direction. If I move in the opposite direction and I start and I go to the left, that is the negative direction. It doesn't matter where I start, if I start at a positive number or a negative number, if I move to the left, it's in the negative direction. If I start either negative or positive and I move to the right, that's the positive direction. Now, definition of a real number is any number that you can plot. You can point a little, you can do a little dot here, right, just like that, on the line, and it exists on the number line. So 3 exists on the number line. 3.5 exists on the number line. Uh, 3.14 blah, 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 pi sits on the number line. Negative 8 sits on the number line. All of those are real numbers. So let's take a few weird ones. Okay. Negative 4.5. Yep, negative 4.5. Well, that's in between negative 4 and negative 5. It's going to be right there. Negative 0 0.75. Well, 0 0.75 is going to be in between 0 and negative 1. So it's approximately right here, uh, about 3 fourths of the way there. Positive 1 half. Well, that's going to be directly in the middle between 1 and 0, so right at point C. The square root of 2. Now, the square root of 2, we don't know exactly what the square root of 2 is because we don't have an exact number for it besides the square root of 2. But we can guesstimate that it's 1.4, uh, yeah, 1.4147, something like that. So it's about 1 and a half, but not quite there. Pi, again, is one of those crazy numbers where we don't know exactly where it is, but we've got a lot of decimals. So 1.141529. So it's about, it's definitely after 3 before 4 and closer to 3 than 4. We can guesstimate where it is on the number line. 
And 4.1, well, that's just a little bit over 1. So even though we don't know exactly where the square root of 2 is and, and pi, it does exist on the real number line. And as you saw, we were dealing with the real numbers, which was that whole entire line. It was all the positive numbers, all the negative numbers, everything in between. It was square roots. It was, it was fractions. It was negatives. It was decimal. So mathematicians like to group things up. And so now we're going to talk about subsets of the real numbers. Now these all belong to the real numbers, but then they're also in a little set of their own. Think of it like this. Uh, a hat, a shirt, or a blouse. Pants, socks, underwear are all clothing, but socks and shoes are in the subset of those items that go on your feet. Think of it like that. So they still belong to the clothing group, but now they're part of a littler group, a subgroup as well. And I shouldn't say littler group, but just another group, the group that belong on your feet. We have the natural numbers, which are the counting numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, and so on, and so on. They are all the positive whole numbers, starting with 1. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Anything I can count are natural numbers. The next group we have are the whole numbers. Whole numbers are the natural numbers and the number 0. All the natural numbers and the number 0. So 0, 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth. The integers are the group that consists with, well, it can does consist of 0, 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth, but then also uh, consists of negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. So it's all the negative whole numbers, 0, and all the positive whole numbers. The integer are the rational numbers, or any number that you can write as A over B, where A and B are integers, and B does not equal zero. Not a lot of zero in the denominator, then it's a rational number. And here's the cool part. Irrationals are all the other numbers. If it's not a rational number, it's an irrational number. So let's check out rational numbers. If a rational number is an integer over an integer, and all of these are examples of integers. As long as I can write them in the form of an integer over an integer, I meet the definition of a rational number. So, 3 fourths. Well, of course, that's an integer, 3, over the integer, 4. That's certainly a rational number. Negative 8. Oh, but that's a whole number. It's, it's, a, it's a single integer. It's a negative 8. Oh, but we can just write it over 1, and now it's a rational number. Negative 8 over 1 is a, is a rational number, and therefore 8. Negative 8 is a rational number. Ne uh, 0 0.75, but that's a decimal. Oh, no, we can rewrite it as a, as a um, fraction, an integer of an integer. 75 over 100, there you go. Good enough integer for me. And then 0 0.33333, where the 3 repeats indefinitely. Well, that's just one-third. Now, here's the thing. Rational numbers can be any decimal that terminates, means that it stops, like 0 0.75. Or, it's any decimal that repeats, because we can always put it into a form of a fraction, like one, uh, 0 0.11111 is one-ninth. That's what rational numbers All right, so let's take this set of numbers, negative 5, negative 3.5, 0, 3 fourths, square root of 3, square root of 5, and 9. But before I do that, I do want to say one thing about irrational numbers. We said rational numbers are, are any number you can put in the form of an integer, in the numerator, integer, on the, on the denominator. But I also said since... Uh, this decimal stops, it terminates, I can therefore put it into a fraction. And if it repeats, I can put it into a fraction. So, an irrational number is a decimal that does not terminate and does not repeat. Pi is an excellent irrational number. E 
is a rational number. The square root of 2 is a rational, irrational number. Square root of 3. Any non-perfect square root is an irrational number. Square root of 4 is rational. Because square root of 4 is 2, 2 I can write as 2 over 1, so that's rational. But square root of 5 is irrational. Okay, now with that knowledge, let's figure out what each of these guys are. Negative 5. Well, negative 5 is not a whole number because whole numbers are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It is an integer because integers can be whole negative numbers. It is a rational number. If you're a rational number, you can't be an irrational number, so it's not an irrational number. But it is real. In fact, all of these are real. I'm not going to, you know, test every single one against their reality. It is a real number. All of these are real numbers. Second number, negative 3.5. It is not a whole number because it deals with a 0.5. It's not an integer because it deals with a 0.5. It is a rational because I can change this into a fraction. And if it's rational, it's not irrational. We already decided it's real. Zero. Oh, zero is a whole number. Yep. Zero is an integer. Yep. Zero is rational. Yep. I can actually put anything under zero, and it's still true. And it is not irrational, and of course it's real. So I'm just going to state what each one of these are. Rational and real. Irrational and real, irrational, and real, whole number, integer, rational, real. Finds a lot of things. All right, so if you missed what I said about uh, what everything is, 0 and 9 are whole numbers. Negative 5, 0, and 9 are integers. Negative 5, negative 3.5, 0, 3 fourths, and 9 are all uh, rational numbers. Square root of 3, square root of 5 are irrational, and all of them are real. So that's it for this lecture. Until next time, be seeing you.